God's calling. <laughs> Just think all those years they'd been waiting. All those years they'd been waiting for what God had promised. And then it starts to unfold. And we know we've been talking about the fulfillment all the different prophetic words that had been declared that people had never really pulled them all together and had a clear picture of what they meant. And then we have how great this story is as it unfolds. Now think about it. God comes into the world and he comes into the world as a baby. How confident is God? That little baby, born in a manger, in the backwater of Bethlehem, was going to be the savior of the world. As we read the gospel story in, in scripture, we, starting in Matthew, it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. And then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. And then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about the angel coming to Mary and this great calling she had on her life that she had been chosen to give birth to Jesus. That would have been complicated enough, but at the same time, she was betrothed to this man named Joseph and now God has to do something to resolve that issue. And we just read how God goes to him and speaks to him. And he being a just and honest and holy person was desirous of participating in that great calling. I want you to think about that because God is calling all of us. You know, as the little video unfolds, it, it, that he chose her. And in the same way he chose us. You're not going to give birth to the Savior of the world, no. But he chose you for something. The Bible says that nobody comes to the Father except the Father draws them. Nobody becomes a Christian until God reaches into your heart and calls you. It maybe happened in a meeting. It maybe happened at home alone. It maybe doesn't matter. But it was God who, in his desire, reached out to you and drew you to himself. How cool is that? God chose you. God chose me. But that wasn't even enough because it says in Luke chapter 2 and verse 1, verse 1, it says, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. This taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. It's funny at this season of the year, if you go shopping or go anywhere, um, fly to another part of the world. It's always that you can't get on a plane because all the tickets are sold out or the weather's too bad that you can't fly or you're in a, an hour long lineup in um, the dollar store or Canadian Tire or wherever you shop. And uh, all that money we're spending, all that taxes the government's taking. And, it, and, and you know, it, it's so amazing to me that this story, which was 
um, happened thousands of years ago, and it happened and it was recorded many, many years ago, thousands of years ago, and yet it so identifies with our situation today. That Mary's chosen to give birth to this child, and amidst that busyness and that big task that God's given to her, she's got to go to another place. So they got to pack up their stuff, and they got to go on this journey. And in the journey, there's so many people that when they get to the hotel, the inn, there's no room for them because all the rooms are booked up. Sound like your life? See, this, the Christmas story isn't just uh, uh, about Jesus being born, but even in the whole story, it it's, talks about how God wants us to live and be and act and operate in those difficult situations. The Christmas story is what you're supposed to do in living out your life. In the call of God, in the, in the importance of what we feel we're supposed to do before Him, we're dragged into this situation in our world where the government wants to take all our money in taxes. Just like theirs. And in the busyness of serving God, everything is busy. There's people, they're in the way, they're holding you back, or so you think. And the plan of God is not to get all bent out of shape about that, but to stay true to the mission that God's called us, knowing that He who is the one who has called us is the one that's going to bring it to pass. And so you got your Christmas shopping list out and you went out to find something and you're frustrated because you can't find something or you can't afford anything or whatever. And you need to learn to trust God in that, that God is able to lead you through that whole thing to make you fulfill his calling, which is to walk with him. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. Now, most of us haven't had an angel visitation. Anybody here actually have an angel that you know of? You may have had some you didn't know of. But has anybody here had one that you know of? No, probably not. And sometimes you think, well, you know, why, why don't I get to have uh, an angel visitation? Right? Why don't I get to have an angel visitation? Personally, I'm not somebody who would really want that. Um, I don't think I want to wake up in the middle of the night and have the angel Gabriel standing at the foot of my bed and <laughs> there and going, I'm going to be going, uh, is it good news or bad news? You know. Um, but you see, sometimes it's because we we want this miraculous expectation we have of something big, something big. It's always something big, you know. Um, but you know what? The, think of all the people in Mary and Joseph's day who didn't get an angel's visitation. Think of all the people who lived in the occupation with, well, by the Roman army that they lived with, who didn't get to have uh, shepherds come and view their birth. Did God not love them? Did God not have a plan for them? Of course he did. Of course he did. The stories are recorded for us that we might be encouraged that in all of the big details, God's doing stuff, and in all the little things, God's doing stuff. Anybody here have disappointments? Sometimes so bad that you can hardly stand it. Been rejected by someone or someone said something nasty or did something awful to you or some plan that you really believed was a good plan that was God's plan and it collapsed. How well are you doing with that? So I want you to think about the disappointment that Mary is going to suffer not too many years down the road. She was a special person. She had to be prepared for this. She was going to be pierced through, it says, with many sorrows. To watch her son, though he was God, to watch him die on a cross. To watch him give his life, to watch him suffer. And they were afraid, and the angel of the Lord said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. You know, I was working on a Christmas carol, I've never finished it. But part of the lines in the Christmas carol are, um, it's the birth of the child that changed all my tomorrows. Peace and joy and happiness, God's gift to me. So we come to Christmas, that needs to be our, our, our experience. That though it's 
busy, though sometimes we're tired, though sometimes we're overwhelmed. But in it, the real thing in it, the bottom of it, is something that is so significant and yet something that is so unrealized by the world, world was the birth of this little baby. And you'll get together with people and you'll sing songs around the Christmas tree or you'll eat lots of turkey and, or whatever. But the reality of it is that thing changed everything. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, the Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. If I said to you that uh, the Savior of the world is coming uh, into Hamilton today, uh, let's go find him, where would you look? Where would you look? You'd be, you'd be down there at the fanciest hotel saying, well, I heard the Savior of the world was, was coming today. Where is he? Or you'd go to the biggest church in town and you'd say, have you, have you seen him yet, the Savior of the world? Where is he? But you see, only drowning men can see him. Do you understand that? Only the desperate recognize the coming of Jesus. <laughs> And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. All this year, for some reason, we've been touching on the glory of God. I don't know if it's come up many times in, in the sermons as they've gone forward. The glory of God. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. All flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. You know, we get caught up in all kinds of things. We want to see the miraculous here. We want, do, you, do you want to see the miraculous or do you want the real thing? And what I mean by that is there's a lot of stuff that goes on. There's a lot of stuff that goes on. And oh yes, wouldn't it be great if we saw all kinds of manifestations happening in the meeting? But you know what? Why are you looking for that? Do you really need a manifestation? Haven't you already met the King of Kings, Lord of Lords? Isn't he alive and well in your life? The key to it is, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, all flesh shall see together, because the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. The only real manifestations come, the only real things come when God speaks it. When God speaks it. If you in your situation right now feel like, oh, I'm, I'm dry, I've got nothing, I don't know what I'm going to do, there's no, you know, I'm almost hopeless. Well, Jesus came into the world to bring hope. That in him all of the dreams and all the plans God had for you would be realized. Isn't that cool? What is it you're hanging on to? What is it you want to do with your life? What is it that is the call that he's given to you? Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Do we have peace and goodwill towards men in our world? Yes. Everywhere, no. Because we have to receive it by faith. Because we have to walk it out by faith. Because we have to be the ambassadors of it by faith. Be born in me, the song she sings. The Bible talks about Christ being born in us as we become born again. He indwells us by his spirit. That we might go out into the world, that we might be the hands and feet of Jesus. You say, well, I don't know, where does it say that we're the hands and feet of Jesus? Doesn't it say that we are his body? The body of Christ, that's another word for the church, or as, it's, as it is in Latin, corpus Christi, which means body of Christ. God has a plan. Have you embraced your plan with the same zeal and Excitement and strength that Mary approached the plan that God had for her life. How hard hers was, how easy, much easier most of ours is. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. You know, you, we're out there sowing. You know, I, I, I've so often talked about, you know, um, how many people here like Christmas cake? 
You love it? Yeah. It's like, uh, no, no. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That's the one thing if I get it, it's like, oh. um, it makes me want to be a re-gifter, right? I, I know somebody who would love that. Oh man, just stick another label on it and send it out. But you know what? That's what God's called us to be. God hasn't called you to walk in this world in your strength. God hasn't called you to walk in this world to give out your love. He's called you to extend and give the love of Christ. What does it say? Freely you have received, freely give. That's re-gifting. I got it for nothing and I'm giving it to you. When we go out into the world to lead people to Christ, we're not leading to us or to our church or to some theology. That's not what we're doing. We're, we're leading them back to the one who reached out to us. Regifting the love of God. That's why we can do it, because in your own strength you can't do it, because you're biased, because you're prejudiced, because you have uh, personal ideas about what's right and wrong. But when God comes, God loves everybody. And he wants us to, to love everybody. And so instead of hanging on to the disappointments, he wants us to surrender to him our disappointments. Because usually our disappointments come from not understanding what it is that God's doing. And when we realize that God wants us to not receive those hurts, those pains, those things, but instead allow Him to heal us. And instead to extend to someone else the love of God. The most amazing thing about Jesus later on in His life is as He's dying on the cross, that He's forgiving everyone. We have an ignorant world that doesn't understand what's happening. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even to Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. You know what's great about that? God didn't tell them to go to Bethlehem. The angel didn't tell them to go to Bethlehem. They said, now let us go and see this great thing that God wants to do. Let's go and see it. And they came with haste and they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying that was told to them concerning the child. And all that heard it wondered at these things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in their heart. You know what? Um, the angels visited the shepherds and they went to see the baby Jesus and they'd heard that he was going to be the savior of the world and practically nothing else changed in their life. Because they went back to where the, she the, the sheep were out in the field and they had to watch them just like they had before. When you became a Christian, you know, some things changed in your life, but there was a whole bunch of things that didn't change. Right? You had this great encounter with God, and God promised you that He would be with you, and that He would love you, and He would protect you, and He would provide for you, and that was fantastic. And then this terrible thing happened to you. You had to go back to your job. Right? You had to go back to every day, maybe it was to school, or to wherever it was. And God had invested that in you, and He had invested that in you because He knew where you were, and He was going to use you where you were, but because we're human, instead we were worried and said, oh, my life's no good, I'm back where I was. No, you're not back where you were. You've been endued with power. In Luke 10 it says, And the seventy returned again with joy to Jesus, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. How exciting that was. Remember the first time you heard about that, casting out demons and stuff like that? How exciting that was. Whoa, this is so cool. And he said I be, unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. 
Behold, I give unto you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not. See how, ex how excited we get about things like that? And Jesus said to them, don't be excited about that. Don't rejoice in that. That the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. He's hidden that from the wise and the prudent. That bothers you because as you're out there reading the newspaper or listening to CNN or the newsmate, all those people, they're talking about totally different stuff than is relevant in your life because they don't have a plan, because they don't see it. It's been blinded their eyes. But God has revealed it to you. The babes in Christ. The, the humble shepherds at the birth of Christ. Notice he didn't go to the temple. The angels didn't go to the temple. They didn't go to the high priest's house and sing out there like singing Christmas carols outside the high priest's house. They came to the lowly shepherds because they were humble. All things are delivered to me of my Father, and no man knoweth who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. And he turned him unto his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes which they see the things that you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which you see, and have not seen them, and to hear the things which you hear, and have not heard them. Do you feel blessed today? That as we celebrate Christmas, there's a lot of people in the world celebrating Christmas. I have no idea what Christmas is really about. Oh yeah, they maybe heard the story of the baby in the manger. Right? But it's totally irrelevant to them. What does a baby that was born over 2,000 years ago have to do with me? In Matthew, we have a similar account of that story, and, and it ends, the passage ends with this, and it's significant that it ends with this. It says, and Jesus said after that, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest on your soul, unto your soul, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Tonight when you go home, later on today when you go home, whenever you go home, I don't know where you're going. When you're finally get to going to bed, if you don't stay up and watch some crazy movie or something, and you lay there, think about that. That what you have so taken for granted over the last 30, 40, 50 years of your life, many educated, powerful people have looked to find and have not been able to see it. You look around this room and you say, where is everybody? Well, many of them are off doing things that God's called to do with family and friends. But there's also a whole thing that, except a man be born again, he cannot even see the kingdom of God. Isn't that interesting? And yet God has invested himself in us. And this isn't a call to action by any means, because the whole point of the story is that Jesus was God's gift to the world. What Jesus wants you to understand, what God wants you to understand is that he has already done it. All you have to do is walk it out. It's not about changing your hairstyle or wearing different clothes or, or um, any of those things. It's about embracing the truth of who he is in your life.
I'm going to close in prayer, and Rick's going to come up to the computer for me. As I pray, I'm going to pray, and then you can play the next piece, okay? Father God, we thank you that we have this reminder every year. Every December 25th, Christmas comes. And almost every year when it comes, we're totally unprepared for it when it gets here. And we say, oh, I wish I had done this, or I should have done that, or I wish I'd put more into it, or I wish I could have made so much more out of it. And, and God, help us to see that the most important thing is that we gather to remember why Jesus came, who Jesus was, and what we have see, received from you through him, eternal life that we would be motivated by that to walk with you and to live with you. We thank you, God, for all you've done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat>